Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Dustin. And today we're going to talk to you about the JP SES springs. Right? Yeah, a little silent captured spring question answering time. Right. So there is a flow chart. We're going to just throw that out there that for those of you that don't want to watch a video that gets into all the details, there's a flow chart on the website that will walk you through everything. Yep. Go down to those rifle parts, buffer springs. You're on that silent captured spring system page right towards the top, spot where you can download the flow chart, right. read right through it. Really, that's going to answer the majority of your questions. But there are some questions that may be a little confusing or you just don't understand the flow chart. So we're going to walk you through that. So we've got small frame, large frame. We're going to kind of break them all down. There's not a big difference, but we're still going to get into each one of them and give you some details. Yeah. So let's start with small frame and let's start with uh, small frame rifles in the SES there. No, oh, absolutely. And I think it's worthwhile saying that the majority of this information is applicable you know, on, on both large and small frame, but we'll make sure to hit the, the specifics, the, the more important details for you on each one. So a small frame, you know, as far as the standard models, we've got our JP SCS 2-15. So that's got the three stainless steel ring weights on it. And that's about a three ounce buffer mass. So equivalent to your standard mil spec carbine buffer. Now, so. before he goes any farther, if you're not sure what you have, your manufacturer uh, may have that on their website, or you can call if you're just running a mil spec one that's definitely online, you can pull up those specs. Yep. Worst case scenario, you can throw it on a you know postage scale or something yep. like that, something sensitive enough to, to give you the right uh, the right measurement there. But um, you know, in general, a, a carbine buffer, standard mil spec is three ounces. A standard mil spec rifle length, small frame buffer is 5.2 ounces. So just kind of starting there. Um, you know, one of the big things that you have to answer and that is in the flow chart is you know, kind of the philosophy of use of the rifle, um, and that's going to get into, you know, is it a competition style rifle? Is it a duty defense style rifle, hunting rifle, so on? Are you planning on running a suppressor or not, or potentially running a suppressor? Maybe, and even, you, yeah. and even there, that's going to yep. change. Yep, there's a, there's a few, you know, a few little options in, in even on the suppressed side. Um, but getting down to it, you know, if, you're, if you've got an existing rifle, you're just trying to uh, get the benefits of the silent captured spring system in there, but you kind of want to match how the rifle has been running for reliability, recoil, impulse. You know, if you've got a three ounce buffer in the rifle, you're going to want to start with that standard JP SCS 2-15. Mm -hmm. Again, match that three ounce buffer mass. Um, if you if the rifle uh, came with an H buffer mass, and you might be thinking, okay, well that's split right between the standard carbine and the H2. Uh, we've had great success with with pointing people that have H buffer mass as the standard in the rifle to the H2. Uh, generally get great reliability out of that. Very, very few issues. So I'd, I'd certainly recommend starting there uh, if your rifle came with a heavier than carbine buffer. Also, if you, if you have a silent captured spring system already and you're not sure which one you bought, you bought it a little while ago, as long as it's a Gen 2 that has the aluminum anodized guide rod, uh, and to separate, the Gen 1 had a stainless steel guide rod, so it was certainly heavier, but you'll be able to see, and we'll get some close-ups here, this is an aluminum guide rod with uh, anodizing on it, and they'll either look kind of gray or a little bronzish because you know, when they get oil soaked into them, they get a little more bronze color to them. Um, but if you've got a Gen 2, you're not sure what you've got, you can look at the ring weights because the tungsten ring weights have a kind of a matte finish to them versus the stainless steel ring weights have a, have a more polished or shiny look to them. So you can identify that way, um, get in there, start with that. Um, ultimately, mass regulation when setting up your system is a little bit more important than spring rate. Uh, and that's, a, that's really where a lot of people get confused. Yep. They want to go jump right to the springs and say, I want to change out springs, and they're not looking at the actual mass. Yep. So mass is much more important for getting the rifle running correctly um, and also accommodating for some of the, the more custom rifle setups or, or more unique you know, rifle setups. Right. Um, but so hitting that correct mass right off the beginning is important. The flow chart's going to really help with that. Um, and then when we get into spring rate, that's more of that fine tuning. So you can make some small differences there uh, by adjusting that spring rate. Um, and I'm going to give one example here. So we'll get into one of those unique rifles, which is a 300 blackout versus 223.556. If you're looking at the flow chart, you see a 223.556. I'm going to run suppressed with that rifle. I'm going to go to the H2. And that's where I'm going to start off with there. Whereas with a 300 blackout, because of the range in the power, kind of the power factor of the ammunition between the subsonic ammunition and the supersonic ammunition, if you run an H2 in that version, if you try to run subsonic suppressed, 
that might not have enough energy to, to cycle the bolt carrier the full distance. So maybe it fails to lock back on the rear. So 300 blackouts, kind of a little bit unique. There is a little asterisk on that flow chart that talks about 300 blackouts specifically, but otherwise suppressed, you're gonna go to H2. Um, but with that spring rate, with that 300 blackout, say for example, you were at a weight where it was cycling, ejecting, but it just wasn't locking back on the last round. So you're almost there. At that point, going to a 5% reduction or even 10% reduction in spring rate is gonna make a huge difference. That's gonna get you that little additional distance back without any negative impact. Now, th those are springs that you have to buy additional or you're gonna buy an actual SES with the springs. Yep. You, they don't just come with the regular SES unless you buy the bag pack. Yep, exactly. So they, just wanna make sure we get that out there. Yep, so I mean, if you think you have one of those more unique setups, so you're not totally sure, or you, you just like to have those options in front of you, maybe you like to tinker, you wanna do a lot of tuning, um, you know, or just feel the differences between those different setups, get the kit version that comes with the alternate springs. Now, just to clarify, the kit version does not come with any additional weights. We get that question pretty often. Does the kit have you know, all the tungsten and all the stainless so I can do anything? It does not. That would unfortunately be uh, cost prohibitive. Um, so you're gonna get the, in the kit version, you're gonna get the alternate spring rates. And in the small frame, so the AR-15 style, uh, you're gonna have five alternates, or five total springs, so four alternates from the one that would come on it. And on the large frame rifles, there are three total springs. So you'd have the one that would normally come on it and the two additional. All right, so I got a question for you. Since we're talking about springs, let's say I, ha I have a spring, I've had an SES for three years, I'm not sure what spring rate's in there. Um, how, how do I know what my spring is actually in on my SES from yep. cleaning it, all the paint and all that's gone? So uh, basically I'd say from about mid 2020 to now, or, yeah, to, to or, now yeah. well, we'll, go, we'll go from mid 2020 to now, if you have a 15 H2, so the two tunks and one stainless so this version, guy right here. Yep, that's gonna come with the 100 spring on it. So that's the strongest spring. Now, before that time, the H2 version would have come with the 85 spring. So that's the same as what's on the JPSES 2-15. A little change there, um, so a little stronger spring rate to go with the, the heavier mass. Um, but you can look at those springs. They come with color on them, so they're, they're color-coded. But after enough cleanings and running of the rifle, uh, the cleaning chemicals will take that paint off. So sometimes that can be a little more difficult to tell. But if you started with it, you just had the standard, you know, the silent captured spring system, you did, did not get the kit version, then the majority of people out there, just based on the timeline, are gonna have an 85 spring in there. And like I said, unless you got a 15 H2 in the last about year, uh, then you could have a 100 spring on there. Now, there's also other ways to change, right? If we want to look at the mass, we want to change the mass, we're just looking at the weights, which we've kind of talked about. Yep, individual stainless steel or tungsten ring weights are also available on the website, so you can do that additional tuning. Um, this would, yeah. would this be for like an instance where I, let's say I bought the H2, it's too heavy, too much, I've put a couple rounds through it, I'm just gonna take this part because this is easy to come apart. Yep, exactly, and we've got another video on the channel that, that goes through the, uh, the disassembly and, and swapping of different components onto the silent captured spring system. So you can check that out for a little bit more detail. Um, I will mention one important part is the front screw, how you take the, the assembly apart, does have Loctite on it. So you wanna make sure to use heat to break that down so you don't strip the screw out because it won't come out unless you heat that right. up. Right. Um, now, when we're talking spring and mass, it is very important that, uh, that you know that again, mass regulation, the mass in there is more important for that getting the, the initial reliability. And a big portion to that has to do with if you're, you know, so you stay, start with the standard version, JPSES 2-15, so you have a three ounce buffer mass and you're shooting and that bolt carrier group is really getting slammed back and forth. So you have that harsh kind of jumping in your mm -hmm. muzzle rise and someone might think, oh, I'll just go to a heavier spring. Uh, there's a downside to that because now you're, you're compressing that stronger spring. So you've got more stored potential energy in the spring. So it's going to push the bolt carrier group forward with more velocity. And if you have too much forward velocity on that bolt carrier group, when that bolt goes into lockup, you're hitting metal on metal, it's, you're going you're to increase the issues with bolt bounce. And to prevent bolt bounce, you need additional mass. So really the correct answer right off the bat was to go to, to, to additional mass regulation. So again, spring rate, you can do fine tuning with that, have little little differences in how the rifle cycles. Or again, like in the three and blackout example there where it was short stroking just a teeny bit. So again, looks like the shell's ejecting at a reasonable angle. You just need to get that bolt carrier back a little bit further. That would be a spot where you could go to that little bit lighter spring rate. But majority of time initially is mass regulation to get that set. All right, so we're just gonna throw a wrench into this whole thing because I got another question for you. Since we're talking about 
fine tuning our setup. What about when we're running like the OSS suppressor versus let's say a Thunder Beast? They're completely different designs. One has the flow through technology, one does not. Yeah, one's more traditional baffle stack. Am style. I gonna be changing mass or am I looking at changing the spring rate? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'd say 99 plus percent of, of, right. silent, or of, of suppressors out there are, are more traditional monocore baffle stack design, K baffle, so on. Mm -hmm. um, and they're gonna, even if they're advertised as low back pressure, um, you're still looking at super high back pressure to really high back pressure versus with something like the OSS, where as a flow to, through technology um, has less back pressure. So it's gonna have, it's gonna change the requirements on timing in the rifle less than a traditional suppressor. Right. Um, you know, as long as we're in on the suppressor talk, one way that you can, you can look at your rifle, obviously, you know, everyone's probably familiar with some of the charts where it talks about where the brass is ejecting, you know, what angle, you know, if it's towards the one o'clock, you know, you have too high a bolt carrier velocity because that brass is kicking forward more um, versus, you know, your, your four o'clock, which is, you know, about correct. Right. And then if it's for throwing further back, then you have low bolt carrier velocity. So that might be an indicator that, you know, either your gas rings are starting to get worn out if, you know, if the rifle had been working fine, so on. Um, but really, the timing of that bolt unlocking from the chamber, you're gonna be able to tell a lot about that by picking up that piece of brass, that spent case that got ejected out and looking at it. Because when you first put your suppressor on the rifle, if you haven't tuned the gas any additionally, um, you know, the gun with the system you have in there runs fine. You put that suppressor on there. When you pick up that piece of brass, it's gonna be covered with carbon fouling. Um, you know, like he means black, like it, yep. it, it is black. It looks like it's been on the range for two, three weeks. Everybody's been stepping on it. Yeah. It's been rained on, it's black. Yep. So, as you start to either tune with your gas, adjustable gas blocks, or you're getting it more tuned in, you'll notice shot to shot, and you don't wanna make big adjustments, everything you wanna do these small adjustments until you find the right spot. Um, you'll notice that carbon, there's less and less carbon deposited on the brass. And of course, the you know your, your action is gonna also remain cleaner through that as well. Mm -hmm. Now when you're shooting unsuppressed, maybe you have just a little bit of carbon up on the neck, and when you're running suppressed, even when it's well tuned in, you may have a little bit, little bit dirtier case than that, but you can certainly get the gun so it's it's running much cleaner. Get so that that carbon fouling is right up at the shoulder and neck area, and because it's not kicking all that carbon fouling back into the action, now you're going to be able to shoot to a lot higher round count before the gun is fouled out and starts to have a malfunction. So that's very important. So when we're looking at the uh, the suppressed aspect of it, why you're getting that carbon fouling on there is the bolt is unlocking prematurely from the chamber when it breaks the seal of the brass to the chamber wall because when that brass when it's pressurized in there, that's pressing the brass against the chamber walls, creating a seal. But when the extractor pulls that, that brass out of the chamber and it breaks that seal, you've basically just uncorked a pressure vessel. So now that hot carbon laden gas is coming rushing past. Mm -hmm. So that's where the brass, you know, it gets deposited on there very quickly. And so you can, again, you can use all these things as indicators for how the rifle is running. Um, there's a lot of info that you can see on that brass. So make sure that uh, if you're out there doing your tuning, you've got a, you know, maybe a tarp or something laid out so you can actually check that. Um, you know, going from there, um, you know, ultimately, if the gun was very dirty and I had an H2 and I've tuned my gas as much as possible for both that combo of mass and gas regulation, if I try to turn the gas down a little bit more because the gun is still, you know, it's still unlocking prematurely, you can still tell that it's very dirty. But if you turn the gas down any more, now you're having malfunctions, you're having cycling issues, the gun is not reliable. Obviously, that's not an acceptable answer. That's where you'd have to go into additional mass regulation. So if you had an H2, you'd get an additional tungsten weight on there, make it an H3, which is about 5.4 ounces. H2 is about 4.6. Standard carbine is about three ounces. So you'd increase the mass then. And you'd notice, because that additional mass there, now you, you're, you're kind of the window of, of tuning for that gas block each click or adjustment in there is gonna make, you know, is gonna be, be less sensitive. So you can do one click and instead of going to the point where it doesn't melt, where it doesn't function yep. anymore, now you've got a bigger window there where you can get that tuning how you need it to get right. the gun running right. So th those are just a lot of keys that you can look at just in general when you're shooting your rifle, right? Yep. In, in trying to figure out what you wanna do with your SES. It's not just have to be suppressed. There's a lot of things to look for. Uh, so let's, let's say like you got, um, 300 blackout, right? Like, I mean, I know we talked about that, but there's still some things to look at. So let's, what, what about like, uh, let's say a piston driven rifle? Yep, absolutely. So 
Piston driven rifles, if you're looking at the flow chart, we talk about those on there. Um, just because of how the piston system works, how that operating system works versus a gas impingement rifle. Gas impingement, I would say gas is compressible, so as it's going in into the bolt carrier, which is essentially like a piston in its own, yeah. it's got the gas rings in there, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a slower, smoother push versus in the piston system because you have a solid metal rod, whether it's a, you know, a little short stroke piston or whatnot. Yeah. Um, you have you know physical steel rod that's hitting a steel key or you know maybe machined into right. the bolt carrier um, so it's it's a sudden impact so it's a little bit more so tearing that bolt out of the chamber um, so it's a harsher impact we want a little more mass regulation in there to help smoothen that out a little bit right. give a better feel and ultimately that's where the h2 version comes into play right and now we're not saying that one's better than the other i mean we have our opinions but for the guys at home that are just in love with their piston driven when he's talking about just everything hitting hard we're just trying to break that down for you guys so no need to go type in and getting all angry with us here there's a lot of great options out there <laughs> what about an sbr so when we're looking at, and when we look at SBRs, it doesn't matter if it's actually a short-barreled rifle or if it's technically a pistol configuration. Getting into the kind of the legal semantics there. So as long as it's a short barrel, um, again, you have a shorter operating system in there. Uh, you want to have a wider operating window, and a little bit more mass in there is going to help with that, give you the reliability you want. Also, the majority of people that are running, you know, an SBR or pistol configuration, it's generally going to lean towards that duty defense type mentality as yep. well, where ultimate reliability is, is certainly the goal and uh, even the necess necessity. Um, so again, I'm going to go into an H2 version there. Um, you know, small frame versus large frame. Again, even if you had a short barreled 308, it's that same basic mentality. Keep in mind on a large frame rifle, the bolt carrier is heavier right off the bat. So there are more rifles in a large frame setup where I'm going to lean towards the 10H2, so JPSCS 2-10H2 right off the bat because you've got to control bolt bounce mm -hmm. and the buffer weights are what are, you know, that's giving you that dead bull hammer effect. That's what's helping to control bolt bounce. So, you know, when you're looking at that chart on a large frame rifle, I'm gonna lean quicker towards the heavier mass. Right. And that seems to be the biggest problem when you're looking at a large frame, is they're notoriously known for bolt bounce, right? So yep. if you're wanting to run that thing fast or uh, you're wanting to double tap a lot, you know, that's can, that can be some of the issue, which brings me into select fire. Yep, absolutely. So select fire, same kind of mentality. It's, it's an, just a more abusive system. And ultimately, you generally have a little bit higher bolt carrier velocity uh, just because of the, the timing of the action. It's kind of almost like it gets getting bounced you know, back and forth. Um, so a little bit heavier buffer mass. You can also use in a select fire rifle that, that buffer mass is going to, or the overall operating system mass, is going to play into cyclic rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people talk about cyclic rate sometimes when they're talking semi-auto and it's really not applicable because, um, you know, it's really based on that point of, of, of how fast you can pull your finger. But there's always a little break in there. There's always a little time uh, for everything to settle down right. where in, in full auto or select fire, um, you know, again, it's, you, you need that additional buffering mass to help control everything. All right. So a couple of years ago, something really cool came out and... Uh, it's the law folder, right? So I can now fold my stock over to the side, use a smaller case, carry it everywhere. When they came out, one reason I didn't go to that was I love my SES. I'm not going to run a rifle without an SES. Yep. Plain and simple. Now, there, there is a kit. We don't have it on this table, but there is a kit for the SES with it. Yeah, you know, with the Law Tactical Folding Stock mm -hmm. Adapter. Yeah, absolutely. You know, initially there was a few places that tried to come up with... You know, a way to make it work, but it really wasn't safe. It wasn't the right answer. Right. So we came out with a silent captured spring system specifically designed to work with a law folding stock adapter. And, and I do mean specifically, there may be some other folding stock adapters out there. The only way that SES would work with those is if they had the exact same dimensions for kind of the thickness of the, the folding hinge and everything. So, you know, um, I, I don't have additional information on exactly which ones that right. might work on or well, we're not. Just, but, we're specifically talking yep. about the law folder. Yep. That's the most brand. popular one out there. The one that everybody wants to run, the one that we yep. know is the safest at yep. this moment, right? So there's, you know, we make options for for each of these in that law tactical folding stock adapter version, and then if you already have a silent captured spring system, you know, again Gen 2 silent captured spring system, um, and you are getting a law tactical folding stock adapter and you want to put that on your rifle, you don't need to necessarily buy a whole new SCS. We do sell a conversion kit for that as well. Okay, so here's another question with the law folder. Because when I look at it, the the slider of the SES is a little longer. Yep. So is that adding more mass where I need to, let's say I was running H2, I now need to go to... 
something lighter, or, or, yeah, not or is that mass not, not enough to mess with it? It's not a significant difference. So that piece is made out of aluminum, so it's, it's a very small weight difference. So that really doesn't need to play into uh, your equation for, for which silent captured spring system to go with. Um, you know, I'd still, in all of the points we mentioned where we'd go to an H2, I would still do that. I think it's worthwhile mentioning there's also competition. Um, where if I'm running a 6.5 Grendel for a PRS style rifle, long range precision shooting, mm -hmm. um, and I wanna have as little reciprocating mass moving back and forth in the gun as possible. In the flow chart, you know, it's gonna say something to the effect of uh, you know, 6.5 Grendel or larger cartridges, you wanna go to the heavier mass. If you have an adjustable gas block and maybe a low mass carrier, and, um, and you, you wanna get a silent captured spring system, again, trying to keep that mass as low as possible, you can, for that kind of competition rifle, you can go to those to the lighter mass uh, to reduce that reciprocating mass inside the firearm, keep you a little flatter shooting, keep you on target. But you have to know that the operating window is gonna be a little narrower. So if you're making some huge change in ammunition, it might require a, a gas adjustment at that point, right. where the additional mass in there, uh, if you were running the H2, um, you know, that's gonna give that wider operating window. It's just gonna be a little more forgiving on a wider yeah. range of ammo. So if you know your rifle, you know what you're using it for, that's why we talk a little bit about philosophy of use, um, then it's okay. You, there are always little exceptions in there and you just have to know how you wanna use that rifle. And you know, for a rifle that someone says, I want it to do everything, well, ultimately, it's always a good excuse to buy, buy or build <laughs> buy, another rifle. Buy, yeah. you know, it's but, but, definitely getting another rifle. But honey, that, that rifle's not safe to use for this purpose. Right. I, you know, I need to build another one. So always room in the safe for yeah. one more gun. So you, know, you were talking about your whole new word you're using in our videos today, philosophy. Uh, the way I run my 308 is not the same way I run my 223. So right. following that flow chart did not work for me because of the way I shoot it. It's an ultralight, the ammo I'm running with there. So I actually had to play with mass. I had to go with all the springs, test all that stuff out. And, and I was able to fine tune it through all that. So it, it's definitely something where if you're in the competition realm, you're wanting to get that rifle to be the smoothest possible, shoot the way that you want it to shoot, it might be worth buying couple weights and buying the entire spring the spring pack and playing with that however if you just want to get one drop it in the rifle you know like we started the video out we definitely have those where they're just ready to go grab them throw them in a rifle and you're good to go yeah and I, again for the majority of people out there the flow chart is is going to be dead on because yep. most people are using the rifles in in a pretty typical fashion where you know again unless you throw a suppressor or something in there um the, the standard choices and where the flow chart tells you to go is gonna be correct. But, um, you know, if you've got one of those unique situations, uh, it's just like building a hot rod. You can buy a crate engine and from the best builder, right. but no matter what, you've gotta get, once it's in the car, you still gotta mess with suspension and yep. all that stuff. You've gotta bring it to your tuner, they've gotta get it all set up. Right. So, same kind of idea, if you're a competition shooter, you're looking for the absolute best feel, well, that depends a lot on you. Uh, we can't necessarily tell you the right setup for you uh, because it, a lot of that is based on feel, that recoil and pulse. Yep. And you in the shot timer and a little time at the range with those different components doing a little bit different setups, that's the only way to answer the exact right, right. You know, build exactly. or configuration for you because uh, some guys you know, want a little faster, sharper cycling rifle. Yep. Some guys want a little bit slower, smoother feel. Um, ultimately, you can make that, that decision at that point. Um, but we've got the options here. We've got the spring rates. We've got the alternate uh, ring weights. Uh, so the whole system is made to be able to allow you to optimize for your rifle. All right guys, so this was a longer video than we normally put out there. There's just a lot of information out there. We receive a lot of questions. It is the most asked about item that we actually have on the website. Like I said, we do have a flow chart. Check out the flow chart. If we did not answer any of your questions or you think you've got something that is a little bit more special, whatever, please leave a comment below. Other than that, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you guys at the range.